Hello and welcome to the NTTV Dialogues, a conversation of ideas. And who better to have on this show than a man with big ideas for India, Nanda Nilikani. Thank you so much uh, for coming in, Mr. Nilikani. It's been an interesting week because we've seen India really be at the forefront of deciding an idea that's divided the online world, and that's mm -hmm. on net neutrality, a really mm -hmm. crucial uh, report which came out uh, by the Telecom Re Regulatory Authority of India and Mr. Ram Sevak Sharma. And I don't know if many people know that Mr. Ram Sevak Sharma actually worked with you on Aadhaar. That's right. Uh, he, uh, I was uh, employee number one of Aadhaar, and he was employee number two. And uh, he was suggested to me by a common friend that there's this great guy in Jharkhand who's a pr uh, in spare time does programming as a hobby. I said, what kind of uh, officer is you does programming as a hobby? But I met him and I told him, look, I'm giving up my career to come. And he said, if you can do it, I can do it. So he joined me and we worked. In fact, you can think of him as the co-architect of Aadhaar mm -hmm. with me. So he's an amazing guy. And I think, but he's really surpassed himself on this net neutrality, I think. I know, because uh, he's taken on Mark Zuckerberg, which is no easy thing for, say, perhaps an Indian bureaucrat to do, and in such a well thought out order. What was your take on it? No, I think if you read the order, it's outstanding. If you see the language, the clarity of uh, purpose, the arguments put so persuasively, the, the, the legal backing, it's a template of a very good, great government order. And I think he's not someone you can trifle with. Mm -hmm. you know. And I think uh, he believes in principles. He's a man of the highest integrity. He's decisive, he's bold, he's fearless. So he's absolutely the right guy in the right place. It's interesting because you had also uh, recently written an editorial on this whole issue of free basics. And because there, there is a view, uh, many have asked that what was wrong with the idea of free basics, that as a concept, it's about inclusion, it's about bringing in those who don't have access to the internet. In a sense, are we being too rigid by uh, completely blocking Facebook's no, free not basics? At all. You I had another option, you thought no, no, a better I think, way. I think, I think we are all for inclusion. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we build Aadhaar, it was for inclusion. So I don't think we don't, it's not that we don't understand inclusion. But inclusion should be done in a market neutral way. It should be done in a way that doesn't favor a company or create a walled garden. And, and that was the whole issue with this model that of course we should make uh, internet uh, available to everyone. And there are many ways to do it. We had suggested having a DBT where you transfer a certain amount of money uh, to the bank account of uh, directly give them data, data time. Mm -hmm. as, a, as like DBT, LPG, you give cash. Here you can give data. And, uh, that's one way to do it. The other way is to encourage Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, there are many, many ways to solve the problem, but it should be done in a market neutral way. It has to be done as a collect, as something that expands everybody's opportunities. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was the article which uh, my co-author Viral Shah and I wrote mm -hmm. uh, some time back. And I think it did help because it sort of put it in a very simple language as to what are the risks of doing this. Mm -hmm. You brought up Aadhaar and of course, uh, that, that switch, and when you talked about uh, Mr. Ram Sevak Sharma as well, somebody within the government service being the co-architect of it. But in a sense, when you look back at Aadhaar, where it began and where it is today, and it's, it's interesting how the current government has really taken on some, a legacy of the previous government, as it were, and added, really pushed it. Does that make you proud today? No, I, th I think we're all very satisfied because uh, six years back, it was just an idea. It was a... Uh, an idea, it was a cabinet note, and uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was kind enough to invite me to actually implement this. And today it's a close to a billion people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 970 million people in India have Aadhaar. So I think to take it from an idea to a billion people in six years in the government system is, is a non-trivial problem. And Did I you believe that could happen six years you ago? You had to believe it. You see, you, if you try to take on such uh, you know, crazy goals, you have to believe it will happen. Otherwise, you can't do it. It didn't worry you because, I mean, I, you had said 600 million and you actually then uh, gave up Aadhaar and then you went to cam uh, campaign and uh, for an election. But did it worry you when you heard uh, th the Prime Minister, many BGP spokespersons at that time say that Aadhaar would be dead if the BGP came to power, it would be reviewed. How apparently a meeting you had with the Prime Minister help, uh, Modi helped change his mind? Well, you know, I think uh, Prime Minister Modi understands technology better than any other politician that I've met. So mm -hmm. I'm sure he, and he, as Chief Minister of Gujarat, he had implemented Aadhaar. So he knew the value. I think the meeting certainly helped maybe in the last 5% of conviction or whatever. There's no awkwardness when you met, uh, no, when no. You met him. Except my Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think uh, it was... Uh, I mean, but I think, here, but I think uh, this government has really supported it. Mm -hmm. uh, when I stepped down, it was 900 and 600 million people. Now it's 970 million. Uh, at that time, the LPG had been started, but the previous government uh, had a sort of uh, some misgivings about it just before the election, so they had stopped it. So he resumed that. They're applying it to PDS, to kerosene, to attendance of bio, uh, a government servant. So now I think 
It's becoming a ubiquitous uh, platform. Mm -hmm. And we are only seeing the beginning of the revolution. You know, in the next five, 10 years, the number of applications that will come will, will be things that we can't even visualize today. Mm -hmm. We've got lots of questions for you. And uh, Angela Glotra from uh, St. Stephen's College has a question. Go ahead, Angela. Uh, you were one of the architects of Aadhaar, and you know the in and abouts of the government. So what were the greatest challenges you had to face, and how did you overcome them? Yeah, well, uh, th I think there are two types of challenges. There were obviously very complex technology challenges, because nobody had built a system of this scale and size for a billion people, and many people told us it can't be done. And then there was the, the political challenge of managing the system, or managing or, or navigating the system challenge. So we designed this in a way that the uh, administrative office was in Delhi, uh, where Ram Sevak and I sat, and the technology team was in Bangalore. And even if you visited the two offices, they would look quite different. <laughs> the Bangalore thing looked more like a startup kind of thing. This looked like a government office. And I think uh, we, uh, we managed to, so I think the challenge was really, the big lesson I learned was that in the private sector, you're answerable only to a few people. If you're the CEO of a company, which I was, you're answerable to your shareholders, to your management team, uh, you know, maybe the board and so on. But here, everybody has a view. There's politicians, bureaucrats, parliament, cabinet, ju uh, media, judi activists, judiciary, everybody has a point of view. So trying to navigate among all these to get to a goal is, is the most complex task. What did you, I mean, you, you had formidable opponents as well when you made that point. At one time, Mr. Chidambaram, a home minister, wasn't convinced at all of Aadhaar. And you, you've written in your book, Rebooting India, how you almost had a Bharat Yatra, that you would always make it a point that you would go to the person's yeah. office. You would never ask them to come and meet you because yeah. it's also about managing egos. What yeah. did you find most difficult coming from the private sector? No, actually, that was uh, easy for me because, you know, if you have been in business and if you have <laughs> been uh, being a salesman, which I was in, in business, one of the roles I did, I, I had no ego in visiting a client anywhere in the world if that led to a business order. So I decided I had 14 months to sort of put things on track. While, while they were building the system, Ramsey work and the technology people are building the system, I went to every state, met all the leaders, chief ministers, chief secretaries, made a presentation on what's coming, got their buy-in. And even when they came to Delhi, I made it a point not to make them come to my office, but I would go to their bhavan. Mm -hmm. For example, one person I really liked was Mr. Sushil Modi. At that time, he was the deputy CM of Bihar and outstanding person and you know finance minister and all that. So I went to meet him in his office. So I went to meet Mr. Raman, Dr. Raman Singh in the Chhattisgarh bhavan. It is a subtle thing that, look, I think it's important enough that I will come to your office and I don't make you come to mine. Mm -hmm. So these are all small things, but it helps in building consensus. Did you find when you looked at all the, when you came in, did you have uh, other kind of misgivings? We talked about Ram Sevik Sharma, but the fact that you're working with the government system, you're working with, uh, and I think uh, Virul Shah mentioned in his book that he was amazed when I think the Director General of Indian, India Post walked in and everyone in the room actually yeah, stands yeah, up. Yeah, so yeah. How, how did you actually adjust to that culture? Because you said that you, you went into thinking, I'm setting up a startup in the government. Yeah, yeah so we tried as far as possible to create a startup-ish culture, uh, but you know, Startups are one, everybody on the first name basis, t-shirts, shorts, that kind of, you know, cappuccino and all that. And government is this structured thing, there are seven layers, there's some guy who brings coffee. So the two different worlds. But we, we sort of figured out a way to, because be, being a startup, we were able to create our own culture. At least in the early days, it was very, very uh, co collegial and entrepreneurial. But over time, there's something like the law of bureaucratic gravity. So all, all startups, even in the government, ultimately become, you know, the same. <laughs> But you get about four or five years to pull off, uh, pull off something. And so that's how we, 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 we tackled it. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's, it's different world. You came in then because pri uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh asked you, what if Prime Minister Modi asked you to do something in government again, another startup of a similar scale? Because you've identified many areas where this kind of startup sure. culture is needed. Would you work with the government again? No, I think, again? you know, I, I've been there, done that in a sense. You know, I think uh, I came here for five years, built Aadhaar, the subsidy system on that, financial inclusion, the GSTN, the electronic tolling. So there's enough, you know, enough of work done. Now I think it's for, time for me to go back to a private life and mm -hmm. encourage uh, startups and disruption. Startups is suddenly the, the buzzword, but you've made the point in your book, and again, that really how we need to have the startup culture across government to, in the key challenges that face India today. Yes. You also suggested, controversially perhaps, uh, some would, uh, would see it as, that you should, must bring in the best minds from across fields. Don't look at this in government and out of government. Yeah. You managed to do that in Aadhaar, but do you think this is something that can be pulled off across government? Really, can it actually happen? It, it has to do, because I think the problems are too uh, complex, too urgent, too large scale.
to be fixed with a inwardly looking inward breeding breeding system you have to bring in the best talent into the system to solve these things in fact i would think that the single biggest thing they should do is bring in at least a thousand laterals into the government from all walks of life mm -hmm. because the freshness of ideas which comes from people with a different experience has a huge impact on problem solving so in in a limited way we did that in aadhar the team was both fantastic people from the government like ram sevak sharma and s some of the best people from the private sector so we were able to sort of bring them all together and because our goal was so large the cultural problem sort of reduced because mm -hmm. the goal was so big there's no point squab squabbling about this uh, hierarchy stuff and all that so when you say when you hear words i mean start up india digital india make in india all uh, very much buzzwords of policy of this government now what do you think needs to be done to translate these ideas you and you did the same time you said aim big so you would aim for so many accounts and jandhan yojana and jam aim big but how do you actually get this to implementation to reality on the ground that so is the real challenge it's 90% of it is execution 90% of it is the daily grind of getting into every process every technology every code making sure it works properly making the right so i think that's where you can you know all the, all the announcements are great but finally it has to translate into things on the ground mm -hmm. and uh, that's how we believed it and we had set a goal that we'll do 600 million aadhars in 5 years we did it in 4 and a half years a budget was running expected to be 12 15000 crores was actually 8000 crores mm -hmm. so it's a rare instance where a project happened ahead of time and less than budget <laughs> I think probably, and I, I don't know whether I think young audience. I think everybody would have an Aadhaar card. Do all of you have Aadhaar cards? Yes. So that really, I think, is. Uh, is anybody here doesn't have one? Unbelievable. Wow. I think that is actually amazing. You're a completely random audience, and I think happily that even when you go to rural India, you will find that do just a cross section, a large number yeah. have Aadhaar. Yeah, that's nine hundred seventy really, million. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's yeah. really a, a huge uh, success. And but let me just go across uh, to Tushar from the Hindu College who has a question. Go ahead, Tushar. Hello, sir. Hi. my question is how significant has been the trai ruling that has does uh, that is in favor of net neutrality for the prospects of promotion of trade in india given that e-commerce websites have a large stake in the economy point of view trai regulation net neutrality is the best thing that could have happened for the internet because it is keeping the internet free for everyone to compete on a level basis it's not biasing the internet for one company and i think this will only lead to the acceleration of innovation so i think net neutrality is of huge strategic importance and i think we should all applaud the tra for doing such a bold thing it's for the future of india and i think we should respect and applaud that i wanted to ask uh, because of course one of the things and now you're leading a relatively less busy lifestyle perhaps than you were during the aadhaar days but you're now looking a lot at startups and investing at in inter an interesting range from aerospace to publishing do you see these or this whole entrepreneurial spirit or startups as a solution to what many say is india's biggest problem that of providing jobs for young people or do you think perhaps we need a much more holistic approach because there is always a worry that we're looking at startups but what about the impact on bharat sure no i think obviously the startups uh, will have to uh, may individually not create jobs but let's take a startup like ola you know ola is run by two young guys bhavish agarwal and ankit bhati who are both 29 or something mm -hmm. right and let's say they have half a million drivers in some sense they have created half a million self employed entrepreneurs running the taxis which they are managing so they're not creating jobs in the classical sense of a factory and creating jobs but in effect they they're creating this ecosystem now they have auto rickshaws so i think the in this new world the way you create jobs is not necessarily by employing them but by enabling platforms that enable other people to have jobs or be entrepreneurs mm -hmm. so i think uh, over time this whole thing will create a huge number of uh, you know uh, like i have an investment in a company called power to sme which is building a platform for matching uh, you know small small companies with suppliers mm -hmm. that will have a big impact another company which i'm involved is called fortigo which is matching truckers to brokers mm -hmm. so you know all these things can lead to dramatic consequences in organizing unorganized markets so that's the philosophy that i have we've got, we've got a budget coming up and of course uh, the uh, sometimes there seems to be a disconnect between uh, at davos which india is described as the bright spot in the world etc but when we come back home with the m focus is much more on figures that are coming out controversy over new gdp figures issues about manufacturing output etc where do you see the india story currently well i think obviously on, on on some points the india story is unexceptional right highest growth rate in the world uh, we are a consuming country so low commodity prices is good for us 
this government has been smart in using low commodity prices to raise tax on petrol, so they managed to earn revenue and you know a lot of good things like that. But uh, I think uh, this is the time to be bold on on, on reforms mm -hmm. because uh, you know by next year, uh, you know we'll already be sort of heading for a election. Yeah, and the UP and this and that. So I think this is the time for them to be bold, take advantage of the situation, and really do some bold stuff. What's the big ticket reforms you would like to see? Well, I think uh, uh, it's certainly on the subsidy front, I think they need to continue what they have done. Uh, you know, they've implemented LPG very successfully and, you know, they've saved $2 billion just using LPG, Aadhaar and all that. Mm -hmm. They have to do the same for kerosene. But the PDS they have to do for the whole country because uh, while making sure everybody gets food from the under the Food Security Act, using Aadhaar will dramatically make it more efficient and, and effective. Mm -hmm. And then the another big one is fertilizer. Fertilizer absorbs... Uh, has a subsidy of 75, 80,000 crores. All these things need to be, uh, you know, put on track. That's just one example. Then I think uh, on GST, while there's a law is one thing, but actually one of the things that I had led in the previous government was setting up a company for GST called GST Network. That company can do a lot more for GST. So law will come and go, but you can actually use that company to get GST in place. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of these things which are, no, uh, little operational, you know, so they're not like headline stuff that have a big impact. Now that you're out of active politics in a sense, does it sadden you when you see the role reversal in a sense, uh, the BJP blocked the GST for uh, very, for consecutive sessions, the Congress is now doing the same thing. Does that disappoint you? No, I, I think we have to find a way to have some common program of ideas that are bipartisan. Aadhaar is, like is one example, which de facto has become bipartisan. Mm -hmm. Uh, though they, uh, you know, it was partisan at one point. Yeah. Yeah. So now you know it's both sides in some sense. GST, uh, you know, stuff where there's a broad agreement, we probably need to carve out and you know make mm -hmm. that happen. While you can still continue to argue on other things, that we need to create that common minimum program kind of thing. No, I hope that would work. It did in Aadhaar. But let me go across. Uh, Deepshika Ranjan has a question. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, my question is that India is an aggregating country and uh, these days a lot of farmers are committing suicide. Campaigns like Make in India campaign is good for the economy, but it's uh, in no way, it's like it's not improving the condition of the farmers. So shouldn't be fulfilling the necessities of the farmers be a priority? What do you think about no, it? Sure, I think absolutely we have to f look at fixing agricultural distress and uh, you know making uh, market access, improving the quality of, but there are a lot of structural issues also because uh, while more than half of people are in, in farming, uh, their contribution to GDP is, is very low because the productivity is not high. So we have to have a way to get these people off the farms and working in uh, either industrial or service jobs. So Make in India is just part of that, though. I think the bigger thing could be construction. You know, construction actually employs millions of people. The other challenge we have, which is the lack of uh, education. You know, unlike China, when they liberalized, everybody was educated. In India, they're not. And if you're not educated, then a lot of jobs are not possible. So there are a lot of structural issues that need to be done. Certainly, Make in India is one of them, but there are many, many other things that we need to do. But uh, Mr. Nilkani, looking at uh, farmers' issues and farmers' suicides, even in Karnataka, you'll have a Bangalore, which may be a center of excellence for startups, but you'll have just kilometers out oh, yeah, of uh, yeah. Bangalore, you'll have farmers killing themselves. You have mm -hmm. this in Maharashtra. You have it in states across India. Why is it that there seems to be this, these t two different or ten different India stories, as it were, and is it true some of the criticism that you'll find that oh the focus goes too much on say what corporates want uh, too much about we talk too much about GDP etc we don't talk enough about farmers suicide numbers no no obviously that's that's a that could be a valid criticism but I think again it's about how do we include them into the uh, fabric of the economy and society uh, how, how, for example if you look at what's happening with fertilizer pesticide and all that there's mm -hmm. a whole issue of water shortage you know, excess water extraction so that's causing farms in Punjab, you know, the huge amount of pesticide, fluoride, uh, you know, fluoride and all that in yes. the water. So there's a lot, it's a very, there are really very naughty problems that, you know, you need to untangle. And uh, sometimes the, the, the media may not focus on, on these kind of things. Also, the other thing which I find is that people want uh, solutions that can be solved in 20 minutes in a talk show. You know, not this talk show, but <laughs> other talk shows. And it's not going to work. These are hard problems. When we took up the other thing, we needed a hard five-year grind mm -hmm. out of the public eye in some sense. We didn't want. And so people have to take on these long-term challenges and relentlessly focus on results. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the way to do it. And in some sense, that's the theme of our book, that we need these startups that do these things. And you, you've also talked in the book about 
how sometimes our politics is stuck in the past. And it, you will see that when you talk about talk shows and headlines, the daily headlines often are dominated by issues that involve caste, mm -hmm. which involve religion, which involve uh, who said what against who. Whereas our politics should be much more fulfilling aspirations. Absolutely. Why is it, in a sense, you've been inside politics, you fought a campaign. Why do you think that fulfilling aspirations is not what perhaps is leads a political campaign? Or because, we go back to yeah, the same old yeah. divides in a campaign. Because the link is too abstract. The link between aspirations and what has been done today is so abstract that it's very difficult to convert that into, uh, I guess, into a political language. But that way, actually, this going back to this net neutrality, mm -hmm. it's a great example. For the first time, it's an issue of the future. And it was fought bitterly, right? In a sense, there were a lot of. So it, it's a rare case where an issue of the future was argued with the same passion as issues of the past. So that's a good sign, actually. But it was done by an apolitical person eventually, in a sense. It wasn't, though, of course, yeah. uh, Ravi Shankar Prasad yeah. and Rahul Gandhi sure. had brought sure. up the issue of net neutrality. Sure. But sure. when you when you were campaigning, did you find that? Did you find it true at all? I mean, you you campaigned in Bangalore South, where you lived. I mean, you were somebody who had delivered, had a track record. But perhaps issues of caste or yeah, which sure, this thing sure. dominated. Yeah. Why do you think voters vote on those lines? Because I don't think they're uh, looking and saying, okay, here's a problem solver, and if he goes to parliament, he'll solve problems. I don't think they see it that way. It boils down to all this, you know, all these uh, caste, religion, this, that, and the other. And uh, so I think uh, that's the way, I guess, politics is. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a meritocracy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you think you'd ever get, do you think you'd ever fight an election again? No, I don't think so. Because, wh why? Because I, I didn't have any competitive advantage in that game. <laughs> really. there's, a, there's a good business reason for not fighting it again. No, no, sense. A good business I, logic. I know how to run a company. I know how to do fund startups. I know how to do a project in government. But I certainly don't know how to do politics. Why I don't have the skill set for doing it. Why is politics seen as a dirty word? Not as a dirty word. It's mm -hmm. just that I don't have the skill sets to uh, you know, mm -hmm. perform well in that space. Mm -hmm. Do you still see yourself as a congressman? But I am uh, yeah, inactive, but yes. Mm -hmm. Do, what, what's the big differences you see between the UPA2 government and the Narendra Modi government? Or what, how would you compare the two? Cow? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. But yeah. No, no. I think uh, 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 obviously this government is far more centralized and, and so on. Uh, but, but as is very obvious, just changing a bunch of uh, party A to party B is not going to solve anything. Mm -hmm. You have to fundamentally reimagine and re-architect the way you do things. It's not, it's not that it's business as usual and you change somebody and some miracle happens. It does not work like that. You have to get into the details. You have to reimagine things. You have to g empower people, give them a long, you know, clear mandate. So if, if, if you don't do that and sort of flit from event to event, it's not going to fix anything. Mm -hmm. You uh, you said jokingly just now, Kao, you said it's still a congressman, and the Congress has attacked Prime Minister Modi on various issues, whether it's uh, being a suit boots or car, and you're wearing a suit in a sense. I don't know why, the, uh, but that's one attack they have. And they've also made this point about uh, hate, and you've seen that in, in Karnataka, which is a Congress government. We just had that incident with the Tanzanian student yeah, who was stripped. Yeah. This rise of, say, hate crimes or violent crimes, uh, it may not even be a rise. It may be just what's been happening in India for years. Yeah. But how can it coexist? with an increasingly progressive uh, young population, increasingly progressive uh, startup culture, in a sense, socially yeah, as well? No, I think finally it boils down to cre creating enough opportunities for people. I think we have a billion plus people. We have the largest number of young people. Their aspirations have been unleashed. You know, in, in the work we do at XTEP, we try to understand what kids want. Kids from very, very humble backgrounds want to be doctors and astronauts and scientists. Mm -hmm. Now, if your system is not able to deliver that, if you're not able to create jobs for them, then any reason to turn on somebody else is a good reason. So I think fundamentally, unless we create a massive upscaling of opportunity for everyone, we're going to have more of these things. To me, it's more symptomatic of the lack of aspirations being met. So I'd like to focus my energy mm -hmm. how to broaden the scope for everyone to rise. You don't think it's party specific? Shashi Thru says you can't have make in India and hate in India. No, Do you that's think true. Absolutely. I, th I think you... you uh, you know, a country, unless it is uh, uh, inclusive, unless it treats everybody the same in the eyes of the law, uh, how, how, it, how can it function? Would you, do you think this government is doing enough on that? I, th I think they should be more forthcoming on some of these issues. I think there's some amount of dichotomy in the way they talk, which creates confusion for people. But in Karnataka as well, and I made that point, it's a Congress government, but we've seen in increasingly violent incidents, uh, stories of a boy and girl, if they sit together of different religions, there'll be, there are problems, there are almost these vigilante mobs which are created, yeah. an anti-outsider yeah. element as well. Why? So I think it's more a societal thing if there's rapid change happening, everybody has a mobile phone, you know, people are meeting people across different castes. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a huge 
churn. Uh, churn on the old order. So there's bound to be a reaction from the from the empire, right? And so when you talk about politics of the future, perhaps addressing these issues right yeah, up front, sure. do you think that's something that's needed from all parties? Yeah, it is, but it should win votes too. I mean, ultimately, it's about winning elections, right? Uh, th that's, that's perhaps one of the failings, we would say, of this, that there's an election around the corner. That there's no time to govern because there's always in campaign mode. There's an election every few months. But just let's go across to Muskan from SRCC. who has got a question as well. Uh, Muskan, go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. So my question is, talking about technology, how can we create a balance between using technology in industries for development and managing the unemployed workforce in our country? So there are two sides. No, it's. I, I, I do don't you mean that technology will actually lose jobs, or uh, did you mean that uh, technology it will, will cut down on jobs? It employment, but uh, the employment, the percentage of people which will be employed when we use technology will be comparatively less when we use labor-intensive techniques in industry. Yeah, but you see, that's not just the only source of jobs. You're right. In a company, if I replace the employees with robots, then it will reduce employment. But what technology does, it reduces transaction costs for doing business. Uh, I give the example of, uh, say, Ola or Fortigo. Suddenly, let's say that there are 10,000 truck drivers who are getting more organized, and they're able to get more business on, th on their trucks. They're able to optimize better using technology. Then they're going to make more money. So that's, that's, that's one example. So I think uh, it's not so much the employment in technology companies I'm talking about. I'm talking about the overall impact on the economy by making things more efficient and reducing cost. That will spur economic activity, which will lead to a lot of jobs. You, you talked as well about uh, change, changing India, ideas for India, and you do that. You talk about those great length in your various books. But when you look at some of the key ideas, when education, because of course in the, the area of philanthropy, a step is something you're doing now. How crucial do you think that really is to changing the India of the future? No, that's absolutely critical. Uh, Egg step came out of uh, you know my wife Rohini works in this field for the last uh, two decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, after I lost the election, I was fairly unemployed. So I'd that's a rare moment in London so in life. Said my, I never had a day when I get up and there's nothing to do, right? So it was a bit disconcerting for me. And then my son-in-law, our son-in-law is graduating from Harvard Business School, so we went to meet him to, for the convocation. And we dropped in at this place called edX, mm -hmm. which is a MOOC for uh, higher education done by Harvard and MIT. And after the meeting, Rooney said, "Why can't you do the same for kids? You know, if you can do it for adults." So I said, what's the size of the problem? She said, 200 million kids. I said, okay, good. After Aadhaar, this is a good thing to follow. <laughs> this is easy. No, I need some big problem to solve. Yeah, the small yeah. problems don't excite me. So uh, we, uh, we started this thing called Egg Step. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that there's a fundamental literacy and numeracy issue. If you look at the Pratham Asar report, mm -hmm. for 10 years, it shows no improvement. Kids can't add to numbers. Kids can't read. Mm -hmm. So we're not looking at solving education. It's trying to solve literacy and numeracy through caring adults. Mm -hmm. So we are coming out uh, uh, with a series of smartphone-based content, mm -hmm. which will be free and ubiquitous, so that people can use them, parents can use them, tuition teachers can use them, NGOs can use them, schools can use them. But finally, raise the quality of basic education, uh, basic literacy and numeracy. Is philanthropy something which is uh, exciting, both Rohini and you nowadays? Because I, I read that, of course, I think the total contributions are over 2,000 crores. We need more philanthropists in India, do you think? that? Uh, no, I, I think philanthropy is a huge thing. Because philanthropy is risk, uh, it's the ultimate risk capital. In other words, capital that the government can't spend on solving a problem, or markets can't spend because there's no return, philanthropists can spend. Mm -hmm. right? So let's say that we spend X crores on this thing. It's fine. I mean, if it, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. There's no, there's no CAG, CBI, CVC asking me, you know, what did I do with the money? So I think that kind of freedom to spend the money uh, gives you a chance to try sort of some long short things. So that's what I like about philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Do you think more Indian rich businessmen need to uh, need to actually look at philanthropy? Oh, I mean, absolutely. You've seen America, the Mark Zuckerberg, 99%. Why is it that in the Indian rich, and they've suddenly been, you've seen Raghuram Rajan has also been after the Indian rich at the moment. Why is it that they seem selfish? No, I think, uh, in fairness to Raghu, he's <laughs> after those who uh, are defaulting, know, bank de loans defaulting the banks and living l lavish lives. Mm -hmm. That is not account to everyone. So I think, uh, no, I think- But he thinks the rich and well-connected have it easy in India. Yeah, so but I think uh, definitely there's a huge case for increasing uh, philanthropy. In the US, it's a well-established custom, right? 120 years back, Andrew Carnegie and Rockefeller and all these guys gave away their fortunes, and that culture is built into their system, partly because they believe that children should not be spoiled with too much money. So they'd rather use it for social purposes. And now- In India, it's the opposite. In India, we sort of say we have to provide for the next 50 generations or some <laughs> funny thing like that. 
So they're obviously the different view. But in, I think there is a lot happening today in philanthropy. I mean, people like um, uh, Azim Premji have been leading the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's doing extraordinary work with the Azim Premji Foundation and so on. And I, we know, I mean, uh, since Rohini is very active in this space, mm -hmm. we can see a discernible shift where more and more Indians are, uh, rich yeah. Indians are doing more work. Mm -hmm. It's still not yet at the U.S. level of philanthropy, but mm -hmm. Kiran Mazumdar does a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. All the Infosys founders do a lot. So lots of people now who do some great stuff. You mentioned that bit when you say woke up and realized you were unemployed, but it just... Uh, I mean, I remember watching an interview with John Stewart once called you the Madonna of Bangalore, or did he say the Madonna of India, the Madonna of Bangalore. In a sense, that was perhaps the first failure in your life, because uh, it just going by your brilliant career from IIT to Patni, Infosys, whatever. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. did that change you as a person, and did it... You mean losing the election? Failing yeah, 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 yeah. No, it was definitely quite mortifying. And also, I think, first of all, as you said, I'm used to success. Mm -hmm. And uh, even when I went from Infosys to government, people said, you're going to fail. <laughs> So even that I didn't fail. So you know you sort of start thinking you're invincible or something. And so when you lose the election, it's it's uh, and also it's a in some sense it's a very public failure. Mm -hmm. It's a public repudiation of who you are. So it took me a while to uh, so, sort of uh, recover from that uh, that uh, thing. But I think uh, once I sort of rationalized it, mm -hmm. and uh, once I got busy with all these things, you know, now I'm fine. Your respect for politicians and campaign went up. Oh, perhaps yeah, it's a damn bit. tough. <laughs> it's, it's a bloody tough business. One interesting bit, and uh, again, when I said I made the point that Aadhaar has lasted, it's interesting how things change when you look back with maybe a perspective of even a year or two. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh often says that history will judge me differently. Do you think that perhaps there is now a perspective when you look back at what uh, the UPA did that you think could, could have worked differently? Do you think, and how big do you think the problem of corruption is in the Indian system? And when we talk about startups and solutions to India's problems, how much is corruption holding us back? Do you think corruption brought on UPA too? Or do you think it was perhaps something else? No, I think corruption or the perception of corruption or whatever, all that definitely contributed to the issue. But I think uh, some great things happened. I think if you look at it, uh, the, some of the great uh, things like uh, RTI. I mm -hmm. think RTI is an extraordinary tool for uh, finding out what's happening. Aadhaar or Narega or the Food Security Act. We're all, they're all, the very fact that they're being continued mm -hmm. shows that they are absolutely you know, viable across uh, governments. So I think they did a lot of great things too, but then they, all the other stuff sort of caught up. Mm -hmm. Do you, as we're ne nearly at the end of the show, I'll take one more question, I think, uh, from uh, Shekhar Suman from SRCC. In India, we are seeing that the focus of all the people is only on tech startups, not on those startups which are not technology-based, like uh, affordable education or affordable uh, hospitality or housing. So why this is so? Because if somebody starts, if somebody is thinking to start something, which is not uh, related to technology, but is uh, wonderful. So uh, I don't think uh, many options available. So uh, this is so. No, I think tech startups have got a lot of attention because that's where the maximum activity is. And it's easy to do a tech startup. I just need to get my credit card, go on Amazon, get some space, and start writing code. So it's easy to do that. But when I look across the board, I'm seeing a lot of very interesting uh, startups. You know, One of the startups I'm investing in, uh, it's out of uh, ID Bombay is doing work in ignition for two wheelers. It's, it's really a electronics hardware. You know, it's like a hardware company. I'm seeing a lot of healthcare startups that are looking at very, very exciting diagnostic stuff at one tenth or one hundredth the value of today's equipment. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing startups in agriculture. So on the ground, actually, the startup space is quite. I agree. There's a bias for technology, but I'm finding in all sectors uh, there are startups now. When he, does it ever remind you to meet all the young startup kids nowadays and you meet a lot of panty? Does it remind you of the days when you all started Infosys and I think one uh, one room, etc. the yeah, excitement, sure. well, the enthusiasm? Yeah, absolutely. Has it, has it come full no, circle definitely. in a way when it's you meet some these young kids? I guess you're trying to relive your youth or something you know, when you do this stuff. Absolutely. But I think I'm very impressed with the youngsters today. They are bold. Uh, they have big ideas, big ambitions. They can, you know, one thing we could never do was lose money. We always had to make a profit. <laughs> These guys drop 50 million a month and they don't seem to be bothered about it. In a sense, not bothered, but they're, they're but quite... But doesn't that worry you? Because many people are questioning the crazy figures so, that are being So I think now. their ability to spend big to get <laughs> business is, is, is very impressive. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of very exciting things to watch. And I'm very happy because what happened was the five years I was working in, in Delhi, mm -hmm. I was not paying attention. I was Aadhaar, Aadhaar, you know, <laughs> Sarkari stuff. So I found by a great coincidence, two great coincidences. One was that... About 15 years back, I funded the first incubator at IIT Bombay. 
as, oh. as an environment. Mm -hmm. And today IIT Bombay and Powai has become a huge uh, startup thing. And the second thing I found was that my house was coincidentally the, in the epicenter of startups of Bangalore, in Koramangala. Mm -hmm. So at least 100 startups within walking distance of my house. So I was like Rip Van Winkle waking <laughs> up and finding you know, 100 startups. <laughs> had changed in five years, yeah. it changed, yeah. So I think uh, it, it's great to see that. And I think uh, disruption, uh, frankly, I rather prefer the disruption of technology than disrupting parliament. As I want to look at disruption, I prefer that kind of disruption. So I think I'm very happy using what I know, which is technology to bring in change in a big way. Mm -hmm. So as we end, and it's been great to have you on the show with us, uh, Mr. Nilikini, but a quick rapid fire round uh, with you. Favorite politician, Indian and global? Favorite politician, Obama. President Obama. Why? No, I think his, his I, I think history will leave him, he's another person who history will judge very well. I think uh, he, he's, he's cool. Mm -hmm. The only guy I know can come in a comedy show and you know deal with uh, John Stewart or whatever. You did too. Yeah, but <laughs> he, he, does, he did recently with, yes. uh, I think, Seinfeld guy, mm -hmm. Jerry, Jer Jerry the guy. Then uh, he, uh, he's, uh, he's del delivered some impressive things in the second term. I think uh, climate change on, on the TPP and on the uh, uh, whole healthcare. Mm -hmm. And after this election, he looked even better. <laughs> yeah, I guess with I know with the uh, Trump and Bernie Sanders, that's another fascinating face-off. But uh, fa Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and Prime Minister Modi. Well, two different uh, people. I, mean. <laughs> I, I shouldn't get into this one. <laughs> Narendra Modi and Rahul Gandhi. Two different people. <laughs> <laughs> what what advice would you give Narendra Modi if you met him tomorrow again, beyond Aadhaar? I think it's presumptuous of mine of me to give him advice, but I think. Uh, uh, it's all about execution and empowering the right people. That's how it's going to get done. What advice would you give Rahul Gandhi? Uh, <laughs> I, th I think he's, he's a very committed, uh, very idealistic uh, person, and I think uh, he has to combine both the short term and the long term. Mm -hmm. What do you love about India the most? I think the extraordinary diversity, the, the, the energy of this place, the youth, the fact that change is happening at this pace. I mean, there's no other place to live right now in the world. What's the one thing you would like to change? I'd like to make sure everyone in India has, can meet their aspirations. Mm -hmm. Hindi movies or Hollywood? Hindi movies or Hollywood? N neither, actually. <laughs> <laughs> how does, the, how does uh, Nanda Nilikini spend a free hour? Doing nothing. <laughs> Seriously. The the best way to do it, you can enjoy some time. How, what that keeps Nandan Nilikani busy nowadays? No, no, I have, a, I have a couple of principles. One is be less busy and more effective. Because I think people confuse busyness with effectiveness. So I do a few things, but I do them systematically so that they have a long-term impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, second thing is that be more generous with your money than your time. Because money is something you, know, you don't need too much of, but time is the precious thing you have. So I follow simple principles and have a good life. Nandan Nilikini, thank you very much for being on the live. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.